think she might have froze. <laughs> nice to meet you, Charles. <laughs> Good afternoon and happy birthday, Mary Ann Shad Carey. I feel like we should all be singing, um, which we can do in harmony. Um, and uh, it is her 197th birthday today, as many um, people here know. Uh, Google got hip to the fact that this is happening. And if you go to the Google search page today, you will see a representation um, of Marianne Shad Carey. Uh, this is a move from buried history to recognition that the people in this room, I think, really appreciate. Uh, we want to start with a shout out to all of the artists, the archivists, the thinkers, the intellectuals, the people who have danced her history and kept it alive. We also want to thank the Mellon Foundation um, for bringing Kristen Mariah to um, the Dig Black or Center for Black Digital Research and Colored Conventions to work with us in an international partnership to really root um, the commemoration of Marianne Shad Carey in the places where she lived um, and struggled and, um, and built for our communities in Canada West, in Wilmington, Delaware in Washington, D.C., where she was the first Black woman to go to law school. This is a part of a, of a large symposium um, and um, uh, that I'll talk about in a second, but I want Christian to say hello to you and greet you before I just give you a little bit of context of where this fits into the work we're doing and, uh, and then hand it over to Shirley Moody Turner, who is the co-director of the Center for Black Digital Research, which we call Dig Black. Love Blackness, excavate Blackness, and uh, digitize blackness. Kristen. Um, I guess I just want to double down on everything that Gabrielle said. We're so excited to see so many of you here celebrating Mary Ann Chad Carey with us. Um, so many people who are um, eager to hear more about her connection to black arts and the way that she's inspired artists and creators today. Um, so thank you so much for showing up. Um, this is going to be wonderful. So this was connected to a symposium that was going to happen in April in person, bringing archivists from um, and scholars from Canada and from D.C. to a symposium that was also going to feature a year of work that Lynette Overby did um, in relationship to bringing the arts to Shad's daughters and to oral histories we'll hear um, up about in a moment. Um, and so we have the opportunity here to, um, to make sure that we can broaden the celebration through the arts and talk about the relationship between Black arts and Black history, the way in which poets and dancers and visual artists have kept our history alive when archivists um, and scholars haven't really been interested over hundreds and hundreds of years. So we wanna recognize cultural artists in that. We also want to recognize the community archivists who and the people who have kept people's papers alive and to say that this is we that our long term plan is to digitize um, Mary Ann Shad Carey's papers and then to transcribe those papers while we celebrate her in the arts through 2023 when we get to celebrate again her uh, her 200 200th anniversary of her birth. This also connects to some of the work that the Center for Black Digital Research is doing, and I'll hand this over to Shirley Moody Turner to talk about the ways in which that fits. Again, greetings. Thank you for being here. We are always stronger together, and I know that Marianne Shad Carey is smiling today as we celebrate her and her birthday. Thank you, Dr. Foreman, and welcome everybody. It is a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about the Black Women's Organizing Archive, and then we will um, go ahead and get started in earnest. So um, as Dr. Foreman said, I'm Shirley Moody Turner. I'm co-directing the new Center for Black Digital Research at Penn State with um, Dr. Foreman and an amazing team and crew that we have at Penn State and Delaware. Um, and we're really happy and we want to thank everybody for joining us here today to celebrate Mary Ann Shag Carey's birthday. 
with artistic and scholarly reflections on her life and legacy. The Center for Black Digital Research is home to the Black Women's Organizing Archive, and that's a project that was born in part out of the Color Conventions Project's award-winning work in bringing the buried histories of Black political organizing to digital life. The Black Women's Organizing Archive continues CCP's commitment to highlighting the work of Black women by moving Black women writers, artists, and activists and intellectuals unapologetically to the forefront of our recovery and Black digital history projects. Through the Black Women's Organizing Archive, we work in collaborative partnerships, as Dr. Foreman said, with community arts organizations, academic institutions, and repositories throughout the US and Canada. And we are indeed um, excited to have Mary Ann Shag Carey and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, um, who were among Colored Conventions speakers, to ground the Black Women's Organizing Archive. These partnerships will lead to greater access to their work and through digitization and transcription projects will advance creative, critical and public engagement with these founda foundational figures, lives and writings. Um, we are really excited to recognize, as Dr. Foreman said, the 200th anniversary of Marianne Shag Carey's birth. Um, in 2023, she'll be the feature of our Douglas Day events. It's an international transcription event that brings together various publics in transcribing and celebrating um, these figures' lives. And in 2025, we'll recognize the 200th anniversary of Frances Harper's birth. Um, we've already had a chance to partner with the Moreland Spingarn Research Center, AKA, um, Dunbar High School, in recognizing Anna Julie Cooper in digitizing and transcribing her writings. In 2021, um, this coming February, we will also recognize Mary Church Terrell in partnership with the Library of Congress. So we'll be, um, we'll be following up with more information about that as well. Um, so today, it's really a great pleasure to be here to celebrate the foundational and pioneering work of North America's first Black newspaper editor and the first woman to be enrolled in law school at Howard University, Mary Ann Shad Carey. So I would like to turn it over to my colleague and co-organizer with Lynette Overby of today's events, Dr. Kristen Mariah. Wow, thank you so much for that introduction, Shirley. Um, that's, you know, I'm a part of it, but it's so exciting to hear all of the things that we have planned coming up. Um, so I'm gonna give you a brief um, overview of the connection between Mary Ann Chad Carey and the arts, um, and then I'll introduce the participants. Um, so, um, as many of you know, um, this is an event which highlights Mary Ann Chad Carey's both personal and professional investment in Black performance and the power of the Black arts. She was one of the too few um, Black feminist speakers in antebellum Black political life. Um, and yet, in many senses, she was also a skilled performer. Um, she frequently crossed the US-Canadian border to give lectures. Um, and um, many people who were, attended the conventions um, had very vivid memories of hearing her speak. Um, and according to AME Bishop Daniel Payne, uh, Mary Ann Chad Carey um, was actually a pleasure to listen to due to her familiarity um, with facts, her knowledge of men and her fine power of discrimination. Um, her insistence on being uh, heard in public courted controversy at the time. Um, Jane Rhodes explains that while Black Americans seem to encourage and even require women's participation in the public sphere as necessary for racial progress, during the antebellum period, Black women were expected to adhere to the cult of domesticity. And obviously, we know that Mary Ann Chad Carey did not do that. Speaking out on stages and in the pages of her newspaper, um, she was no angel of the house. Um, and that's, what, in fact, some of the reason why we celebrate her today. Furthermore, as an editor and writer, Chad Carey was keenly focused on the Black arts and Black performance. She covered the latest developments in the careers of Black superstars like opera singer Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield and Black thespian Ira Aldridge in the first issue of the Provincial Freeman. And coverage of the Black arts remained a key feature of the Provincial Freeman. And so today I introduce you to a group of speakers whose work actually builds on that legacy. Emily Andre Jabois is a graduate student at Ryerson University in Toronto. Her interests include Black Canadian and immigration history, archives and memory, print and visual media analysis, theatrical performance, and social and liberation movements. Her scholarly work on Marianne Chad Carey appears in Woman in the Promised Land, 
an edited collection that reframes Canadian history through the lens of African Canadian women's lived experiences. Lynette Young Overby is Professor of Theater and Deputy Director of the Community Engagement Initiative at the University of Delaware and Artistic Director for the Sharing Our Legacy Dance Theater Ensemble. She served as one of the 10 dance educators responsible for the development of the National Core Art Standards. Overby's leadership roles have included serving as president of the National Dance Association, the Michigan Dance Council, and the Delaware Dance Education Organization. She currently serves as director of research for the Dance and Child International Organization. In the area of community engagement, she served as associate dean for outreach and engagement at Michigan State University and faculty director of undergraduate research and experiential learning at the University of Delaware. She is the author or editor of over 50 publications, including 12 books. Her honors include the 2018 to the 2018 Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Dance Education Organization. Ralph Anthony Russell received his doctorate in composition from the University of California, Santa Barbara. His compositions, which include works for large and small ensembles, have been performed by the Detroit Symphony Orchestra and at the College Music Society, Iowa Composers Forum, and Society of Composers Concerts, and the University of Alabama Huntsville New Music Festival. Russell's works include Contemplative Moments, Serenade, Spiritual Journey, and Dawn to Dusk. Recently, he composed and arranged short pieces for several dramatic productions, Dave the Potter, Same Story, Different Countries, Women of Consequence, and Mary Ann Chad Carey, Her Life and Legacy. Charles C. Smith is a lecturer at the University of Toronto Scarborough, a member of the Canadian Court Challenges Program slash Equality Rights Panel, and a research associate with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. He has served as equity advisor to the Canadian Bar Association and the Law Society of Upper Canada. Before joining the Law Society, Charles served as the manager of the Access and Equity Centre with the City of Toronto and the former municipality of Metropolitan Toronto, where he developed numerous policies and programs to enable successful implementation of equity and diversity initiatives. Charles is also a published poet, playwright, and essayist. He won second prize for his play, Last Days for the Desperate, from Black Theatre Canada. He has edited three collections of poetry, has one published book, Partial Lives, and his poetry has appeared in numerous journals and magazines. He is also the artistic director of the Wind in the Leaves Dance Collective. And last but not least, April Singleton is a senior at the University of Delaware studying entrepreneurship with a custom concentration in equity through entrepreneurship. She studied dance since she was a freshman at Dover High School and joined Sharing Our Legacy Dance Theater four years later when she met Dr. Overby. Since being exposed to racial justice work through the arts, she's been inspired to expand this passion in her own way. With a cumulative of $15,000 in funding from her undergraduate program, she is currently working on a startup that empowers high school students to do the same and was recently awarded the 2020 Student Siegfried Award for Entrepreneurial Leadership. Now I will turn it over to our participants. Hello, so first up, we'll have, yes, um, we'll have Charles reading. Hi, um, honored to be here and uh, thanks so much to the organizers for including me. Um, I'm going to read a poem that comes from my book, Travelogue of the Believe. And just to give a bit of background, some context, um, I was inspired by a quote from Ronaldo Walcott's book, Black Like Who, where he kind of says that one of the major challenges, and I'm paraphrasing, for Black Canadian artists is to struggle against erasure. It's really interesting. Uh, I'm from New York originally, and I've been living in Canada for quite some time. Um, where the history of Black presence in Canada is one that is sort of dismissed, we can say, and so the question around erasure. And in doing the research for this book, I was really struck by the number of women who played prominent roles in Canadian, what we now call our human rights regime, Chloe Cooley, Marianne Shad, Carey, uh, Viola Desmond, and others who are really instrumental. 
I'm going to read this poem um, for Marianne Shadkari. Long before other women, you ran a newspaper, started schools, let your voice ripple across the 49th and 51st line. Neither home here or south of the border, staggered by brandings and whiplash, struck by bondsmen and shackles, at words with churches and abolitionists who wanted nothing more than separate spaces to house black bodies on their own. In Elgin, Dawn, Buxton, Winchester, Sandwich, Haiti, Jamaica, or Sierra Leone. You used a man's name in print, but not among suffragettes who had other ways to keep their distance. Yet with both you cut a syntax fierce and uncensored, and what those children you taught learned became the call to all you left across southern fields and eastern coasts and within Midwestern farms. This was the space you balanced, and it was all that mattered, what your body told you because of breasts, buttocks, blackness, what your words spelled inside the provincial freeman when you crossed these lines with everything you ever held precious riding like lightning through this northern air. You were then driven across boundaries in ways only a few could understand, so built your work like a well out of the earth in Chatham and Windsor, where you set down into an endless resistance. Thank you, Charles. Um, and that will uh, allow us to move into another art form. Um, you're going to see a slide presentation of our multidisciplinary production of Marianne Shad Carey, Her Life and Legacy. The contributors included a long list of students, performers, seasoned professionals. In fact, we had individuals from age 11 to 72. Poets, historians, educators, uh, choreographers, performers, they all contributed to this work. Um, we're gonna share now it's a short um, five minute video that hopefully you'll see her story through, through the movement uh, slides. Thank you. Mary Ann Shadkari, Her Life and Legacy. Mary, born free, did not have to endure slavery. However, she fought for the rights of enslaved and disenfranchised African Americans. We will now look at a reflection of Mary Ann Shadkari's legacy throughout her lifetime. In 1800s Wilmington, where Mary Ann grew up, Playing fun games was an important part of her childhood. However, it was also a time when education opportunities were denied to African American girls, and that was not okay. Thereafter, Marianne and her family moved to Pennsylvania, where there she was educated. During that time, her papa was a leader in the colored convention movement and her family provided a stop on the Underground Railroad. Her father inspired her. He was her inspiration. The Fugitive Slave Law made it a challenge for free and enslaved African Americans to feel safe. The law was passed by the United States Congress on September 18, 1850, as part of the Compromise of 1850 between Southern slave holding interests and the Northern free soilers. Abolitionists nicknamed it the Bloodhound Law for the dogs that were used to track down runaway slaves. Oh no, this law did not deter the African Americans. They were determined to survive and to stand strong in unity together. After the Fugitive Slave Law was established, Canada became a refuge for many African Americans, including Marianne's family. Even Canada was not without its challenges. There was also a challenge that Mary had to face, the fear within herself. But Mary overcame the challenges and became the first African-American woman to serve as editor of a major newspaper, 
the provincial freeman. On June 30th, 1855, she wrote, to colored women, we have a word. We have broken the editorial ice, whether willingly or not, for your class in America. So go to editing, as many of you are willing, and as soon as you may. That's if you think you are ready. At the 1855 Colored Convention, Mary spoke plainly when she stood and told of the evil acts of slavery. She was not alone in her passion on behalf of the people. Oh no, other women overcame their own adversity and stood together in the fight for freedom and equality. In 1871, along with several other forward-thinking women, Mary attempted to register to vote in Washington, D.C. That's right. The women went to their nation's capital to register to vote. Even though they did not succeed, they made sure to get an official sign affidavit recognizing this action. Oh, yes, they did. And just as Mary did, our superwomen led us from fear to empowerment, from the unknown to wisdom, from suppression to expression, from following to leading. They give birth to freedom within us. Take a moment and think about a woman in your life who overcame barriers and who is super to you. Together, our legacy is super. We hope you have enjoyed this and learned about Marianne Sher Carey, a truly remarkable woman. We hope you will live out her legacy and pass the baton of empowerment to everyone you encounter. Because together, this is our legacy. Mary Ann Shad Carey. Great, thank you so much for sharing that video, Lynette. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our panelists now um, with a couple of broad questions. But even as we're chatting, if you have any questions of your own um, that you'd like to ask our panelists, please feel free to share them in the chat. Um, but um, to start off, um, I'm wondering if uh, you guys can talk about um, which aspects of Mary Ann Ted Carey's life um, make her ripe for artistic interpretation. So and that uh, can go to anybody. Wow. So hello, everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, Lynette, I would like you to start. I think, you know, after the presentation, that would be. No, thank you, uh, Emily. That, that's the, the challenge of Zoom, right? We can't <laughs> know when to talk. But um, yeah, so I would just say, as you could see in, in that depiction of her uh, life through our, um, even though you couldn't see the movement, you could see uh, kind of shapes along with the the dialogue. And so we see that there are many aspects of her life that are ripe for artistic expression from her life as a child in Delaware, her family's moved to Pennsylvania so she could get an education or immigration to Canada, her triumph as an educator and editor as the first black woman to produce a newspaper. And in addition, her work as a suffragette, lawyer, educator, so many stories um, ripe with, uh, for artistic interpretation. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Lynette. Yes, thank you, Lynette. Um, I agree with that. I, As I was watching the presentation, one thing that stuck with me was really the stress on um, many Black women who have set the path, who have, you know, who have an, a legacy. And a lot of my work is about recognizing Black women's legacies. And so I think... Um, Parts of Marianne Shad's life that are ripe for artistic interpretation and performance is really, it really depends on what stories you're telling and why you're telling them. So I feel like as a Black woman um, who grew up in Canada, I'm able to relate to Marianne Shad Carey in the performance you will see later. You will, I, I will maybe talk a little bit about the experience of actually performing her life. And so I don't think there's anything in particular about her, but the fact that she was uh, here in Canada, that she accomplished so much. And um, and so 
depending on which audience I'm speaking to, I might focus on a different aspect of her life to be able to convey an idea, to affirm our presence as Black people in Canada, in the U.S., you know, around the world. Um, yeah, so I think that it, it's because I approach my art as a way to heal and to tell stories and to express stories that are forgotten, I see that any part of her life could be fruitful to these sort of discussions. Thank you so much, Emily. I would have to say that uh, Marianne Sherry Carey's role as a teacher really inspired me. I, I put teachers very high, dating back to my elementary teacher. She reminded me so much about the, her dedication to educate and to see education as a form of liberation. So when I wrote some pieces for her, I kind of drew on her energy, her, her role as a teacher, and as well as an activist. Even though throughout her, her career, uh, going to law school, recruiting for doing the Civil War, she was still pretty much a teacher. And I think that aspect out of all of her uh, roles hit me the most. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, for me, um, and I think uh, the other three have said it really well, the inspiring, I, I was in the museum in Chatham, um, one of the places that um, Marianne settled. And, you know, you have to think back, use the imagination of what was it like in the 1840s to build schools, to teach in the schools, to have those schools have the highest standard of education in the province. Well, now it's called Ontario at that time, Upper Canada. She did. White students wanted to go to that school because the education was better. It wasn't until racist segregation set in that suddenly our you know, black schools got less resources. And this was like, wow. I mean, so for me with poetry, you know, situations of uniqueness, of going against the grain, of being so incredibly novel that, I mean, like we've said, teacher, lawyer, uh, suffragette, fighting white women in the suffragette movement, uh, fighting men <laughs> to be, you know, black men in the abolition movement. I mean, like, wow, you know, she, there was no stopping her. So, of course, she's a force. Uh, we say a force of nature, and nature is what we create from. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, you know, one of the wonderful things, oh, sorry, April. No, sorry. I would also like to add um, force of nature is like, like such those three words sort of encapsulate Marianne Shed Carey, but what I like about her story and how it can be for artistic interpretation, it's relatable in the fact that she is a force of nature, but she became that through her choices and through her decisions and her mindset. And those are all things that we can control like for ourselves. And so when we look at a production like this, um, I hope that people in the audience can see themselves as Marianne Shed Carey, making the decisions, making that mindset, making those strides and whatever capacity that we need to. Yeah. Thank you, April. And I love that you brought that back to audiences um, because my next question is about performance. Um, and I'm wondering if our panelists can um, speak to maybe some of the ways that um, performance can help us understand Mary Ann Ted Carey's legacy um, in a way that's perhaps different from other forms um, like biography um, or um, more formal forms of scholarly research. Um, sir, I can start. Um, so in this project, uh, along with some past, we incorporate what we call arts-based research. And this is a methodology that engages the arts as a strategy to illuminate a concept. And in the case of Marion Shedd Carey production, our goal was to enable the audience to see and feel her life unfolding. So as we toured the production, we actually did a pre-post test. So we had a little you know, what do you know about Marianne Sher Carey before the production and then after, and then had them also uh, provide any other insight. And there's usually zero before, and oh, I learned a lot after. So just through performance, through a 45 minute performance um, and incorporating the art space research, it allowed them to empathize and feel and learn about her life.
Yeah, um, with my my reading, number one, as I just did, um, it's always interesting when people come to me afterward and want to break up some of the images to get a better understanding. Uh, because clearly, you know, Canadians don't know very much about her, sadly. Um, the second thing, though, is in performance with my uh, performing arts group, Women in the Leaves Collective, uh, we've created movement um, to uh, that poem. But we coupled that poem with two others about two other women, Chloe Cooley, who was sold into slavery uh, in, into, into what was then the United States or the beginning of the United States, and also Viola Desmond. Uh, because, you know, when it, we wanted to put the three women together because of the way in which they have led human rights struggles in this country um, through their resilience and their energy. And to show, sort of show that, you know, so when you see the performance, actually, you know, the costume, for example, the movements, the way the dancers will interpret the words, uh, will show the relationship between her and Viola Desmond, for, for example really quite important. And so it gives more meaning to the audience, which comes up and then talks to us about other things, like the Pullman Porters, for example, and say other ways in which Black lives have really influenced the Canadian scene. Yes, I definitely agree. I think that performance gives so many layers and depth to us, our understanding of these women's lives. and. Um, I think that there's something about watching a piece about someone's life, whether it's Marianne Shakir, whether it's, because the thing too is that there's, there's so much that we still haven't discussed, that we still haven't researched, that we still haven't put in the forefront. So to me, Marianne Shakir, Viola Desmond, Chloe Cooley, these women are amongst other women who were also organizing who are also very much invested and they are a way for us to to access that history so when there is performance and you see a body actually enacting these emotions you have a body in context you know maybe in the cold um, if you have a dancer in the cold that could actually um, create a parallel with maybe what Marianne Shad Carey was experiencing, maybe what Chloe Cooley experienced as she was trying to run away, right? So I think that performance is really unique in giving really a multi-dimensional perspective on, on these women's lives and also on humanizing them. A lot of, um, when I first started working on Marianne Shad Carey, it was in the early two, uh, or I'd say maybe around 2010. And, um, a lot of the rhetoric was around her being so harsh and, and you know, she, she was a strong woman, right? And there were all these descriptors that really, I think, were also dehumanizing her because in the context she was living in, she had to be clear about her choices. She had to say what she wanted. She had to stand up for herself and for other women. And so when Jane Rhodes says, you know, she broke the editorial ice, yeah, she broke that glass ceiling for many, for many women. And I think that instead of continuing the narrative of the strong black woman of you know that sort of um aggressive woman i think that also humanizing these women understanding that these struggles were very real but that they were also human that they had you know full lives is also important and can be portrayed through performance So perhaps I can move on to my next question then. Um, and I know that Dr. Overby has shared a little bit about her research methodology. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can um, tell me a little bit about your own um, sort of artistic and research practices. Well, I guess I'll just share quickly. Um, so I'm an academic. I'm also a performing artist. I'm a dance artist. And uh, what I've noticed is that I actually have different ways of approaching my academic research and my research that goes into my dance. So my academic research is more, a little bit more traditional, like reading. I do a little bit of daydreaming. Then I sort of follow the clues, going to the archives, you know, compare, um, 
sources, especially in the case of Black women's histories here in Canada. American books, American sources are extremely valuable for us. Um, but then when it comes to dance, what I notice that I do is that, yes, I'll take these stories. But um, as Charles mentioned, actually, I'll look at, I'll look into movement. You know, how could this feel? How could this be represented? In that time, what made that this have looked like? Maybe what, what movement comes from my body? So it's also very intuitive in that, oh, you know, how would I move? How would I make this movement? How would she feel? You know, um, and, and even in my interpretation of Mary and Shad, I, I actually wanted to play with sensuality a little bit. You know, we never talk about her as sensual. So then what happens when I add that into the vocabulary of how I would imagine her to be? So, um, so yeah, I think I, when it comes to arts, um, I, I like to be a little bit more playful with it and, and also being careful not to um, impose anything onto these women's lives, but to speculate responsibly about how how could it have been like. And I, um, and I do relate to the arts-based research methodology that Lynette expressed, um, explained earlier. Uh, well, I can talk a little bit about, so our process really started, ooh, March of 2019. And we brought together uh, 20 or more people, undergraduate students, graduate students, choreographers, historians, editors, I mean, educators, poets, composers, and first started by studying the history and Gabrielle Foreman and her associates came into uh, our space and shared knowledge and resources. We read the biography, we looked at YouTube videos, and then we began to embody her story through music, through movement and through poetry. And eventually poems were created, music was composed, and the choreographers began the task of integrating those stories and poems and music into structured movement sequences. Um, and so, um, as you could, so one of the stories was about her move to Canada and our, my way of beginning that choreography was to have people to imagine what it felt like to have to move from your home. What is that like? What is it like to have to work so hard to be, um, to be an educator? And what does it feel like to be triumphant as an editor? So using movement to focus on certain areas. Well, for me, um, as a composer, we're, we're expected to learn a lot about the artists. And so when I started working on the project, I read the book and the first chapter, The Making of an Activist, which covers her as a teacher. I wanted to write a piece that was simple, a uh, quartet, which includes flute, oboe, cello, and piano. And I wanted something that reflected the joy of learning, uh, the discovery of learning, and sort of created this relationship between Mary Ann Shad Carey and her students. So you hear recurring melodies and counter melodies and this middle section where it's a little bit tense and then it returns to the main, main melody. So as a composer, we have to be careful not to be too abstract, but not to be too descriptive. And working with Lynette and also Teresa, I took some guidance from that, from, uh, from how they wanted the piece to be constructed, what's the goal of the piece. And the only thing I had to do with the, uh, uh, the first piece was just change the key. Uh, Teresa felt it, sh it, was, it shouldn't be in C major, she wanted an E flat major, which made it a little bit complicated, but as a composer, we're supposed to collaborate. So reading a lot, uh, is what we're expected to do in order to present a piece that's representative of that person. Yeah, I mean, others have said um, a lot of what I've done as well. I want to add um, that one of the things they also did was in my classes ask students if they knew who she was. And uh, the resounding silence was really indicative. Um, and that was really quite, it was, it, to me, that was a, um, let's say, a blight on our education system. Um, that long before the first white woman became a doctor, long before the first white woman became a lawyer in Canada, 1870s, 1890s, here she was doing all that, right? and more, and more. 
So it opened a door to me around the importance of um, her as a um, figure who needed to be known because of the richness we now have in Canadian law, in the struggles that women have um, faced here, particularly black women. Uh, and I think of contemporary, you know, our advocates today with Black Lives Matter or with the Black Action Defense Committee a while ago, where there was strong women leadership in those, you know, so it really paints a picture that I think she began here um, quite some time ago. I, I don't think it was by intention. I'm going to set the tone for the next century, uh, but just, you know, it's got to get done. And, and so that to me, and I want to go back to Emily's comment about daydreaming, I call it trance. I and mean, I really just kind of get into a deep, how do I imagine this? You know, it's like, here I am, it's the 21st century, and I'm going back almost 200 years to think about how this person might have done what she did. And what kind of energy can I learn from for that? Resilience. You know, we're always told about, oh, you know, there's a new idea that comes up in white circles called resilience. And I said, you know, just look at our lives. We've been resilient for a long time. Don't lecture me on resilience, right? Look at what Marianne, Cat what Marianne did. Look at what others did uh, as well. So that, that part to me of talking to others really is inspiration to kind of push against the grain, so to speak. And also just really honor, honor the strength, the dignity, the integrity of um, of uh, of her and her time and how that's had an influence today. And may I add, um, thank you, Charles. Um, as you were speaking, it also reminded me that a big part of my research process, especially in dance, is also talking to other people. So, you know, getting a sense of what were their perspective on what Marianne Shad did. What, you know, maybe somebody read something that I didn't know about. Maybe somebody is, um, you know, a descendant of Marianne Shad Carey. I have met um, I have met some some uh, family members of some of the women that I, I researched. So I think, yeah, connecting with people is definitely a big part of it. Thank you. We are just bursting with questions in the chat um, and um, from our attendees. So Sheila Patterson has been um, waiting patiently. Um, so I'm going to see if um, I can allow her to talk now. And, um, okay. Uh, Sheila, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Do you have a question for our panelists? Um, well, no, but I'm very excited to see, I call those my student and my sorority sister and very happy to be on the line and learn more, even though I did have a chance of what, about two weeks for getting to know them. So no question. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Jim Casey um, has a great question, um, which I will pose to our panelists. Um, so Jim says, I'd love to hear the brilliant panelists talk a bit more about one of the bigger challenges facing those of us working on the digital archives. How do we balance the recovery of heroic individuals such as Shad with the need to reflect their broader networks and the collectives that they join and enliven? So just quickly, I, I love that question. And um, what I've started doing is actually, especially during this COVID time when I cannot access all of the archives, I've actually requested if um, archivists could digitize specific collections. And um, to my surprise, it actually has happened. Um, I, I, ha I happen to want to access an archive in Montreal. I'm currently in Toronto. And the archivist actually agreed to, um, to digitize the entire folder that I needed. And what was amazing is that in that folder, because they had done so much work in describing what was in the folder, I actually was able to find a connection between Mary and Shad Carey and the Colored Women's uh, Club of Montreal, um, some of the work they had been doing in the community in the early 1900s. So I think that first by asking, by requesting what you absolutely need, and by believing that, you know, a lot of these uh, collections that are not digitized, many of which are not organized, need to be organized, and they need to be organized now. So it's okay to actually ask for that and to, to yes, be very clear about what you need and, and in a way hope for the best, but also understand that there are some people that are willing and ready to do it. Thank you. 
And we are nearing the end of our Q&A session. We, we've got a great question from Sabrina Evans. So Sabrina Evans says, I know that Mary Ann Chad Carey's archived materials are scattered across the various areas that she lived. For those panelists that have engaged with pieces of her archive, how has it impacted their scholarship? Uh, well, I, I guess I would say that uh, it's just wonderful to have this collaboration with uh, Gabrielle Foreman and the, the color conventions. They were very helpful in helping us to uncover a lot of the material, but of course not all. Um, and I think that's something that we'll need to continue to work towards in the future. And also that question made me think about how we want to make these materials available through to K-12 uh, and education settings. and. Uh, a digital format of bringing together not only the artistic aspects, but also the scholarly aspects and providing that to teachers will allow more K-12 students to have access to these, uh, this material. Yeah, um, for me, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, visiting uh, Chatham, for example, and staying there for some time, you get a feeling of the earth. You know, this is sort of going back to the comment earlier about trance. You know, how do you imagine the world of 1840s? You, you can't do that looking out the window. And so you got to go inside and you got to go inside deep. Um, and so the archives help because they give a sense of that time um, that you have to kind of spring off of and go and try to find more inside oneself. And it gives a sense of reality more so than reading a scholarly text. Uh, not to dismiss scholarly texts because they're really important, but you know you kind of get to the root, so to speak. Uh, and that that is really critical, I find, in in, in for me to find voice on um, uh, a person's life, uh, a person who quite literally has inspired a lot of my work uh, in terms of you know my stretch from being a poet and performer to writing scholarly articles, to teaching in um, post-secondary uh, uh, institutions. I would say as a composer, I'm always looking for inspiration. And uh, so I look at the, uh, the activists from the past, including Harriet Tubman, Marianne Shad Carey, just looking for ways to present their work to a larger audience. And this is a long history of black composers uh, representing or doing works by and about activists from uh, Malcolm X to the Central Park Five. So we're continuing to do that. So this Mary Ann Shad Carey project uh, is, has so served as a source of inspiration for me. And uh, as a composer, as I'm always looking for new inspiration. And, and I'm glad in the past I've attended uh, uh, dance concert, Alvin Ailey, attending the University of Delaware concerts to see dancers. So uh, for those who are out there looking to write music or do things like that, you have to broaden your your horizon, listen to poets and walk, go to dance concert, and listen to a lot of music and do a lot of reading in order to get that inspiration. I'd also like to add that it it sort of molded the rest of the things I was involved in, you know, whether it's like math class or like <laughs> uh, my business class, how can I incorporate um, that history and that emotion that is tied to black resilience and black excellence and how can we bring that in every single thing that we're involved in. And so it's sort of, impacted like my whole future without me even realizing that it was in the process so yeah thank you so much um can i just add one thing because it's really wonderful question from gabrielle about uh responsible speculation and i think you know emily and i have really talked about you know this sort of imagination where someone could say that didn't really happen you kind of have to say well it, it did my niece did a book a while ago on Michelle Obama called American Tapestry, the white, black, and mixed race origins of Michelle Obama. And in some of the areas of the book, she can, she's uncertain as to what really happened. So she constructs a picture based upon what's known. So, you know, if this happened and this happened, 
this likely happened. And you go through that because there's so much that we don't know about, you know, our pasts have been erased uh, across North America in many respects. So how do we put this puzzle together becomes really important, but to do it responsibly saying, well, this is likely what happened because we know these other things have happened. And some of the stories that we are finding now uh, coming through those veins are really quite critical. The, yes, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yes, thank you, Charles. Um, then that is a really great question. And as a performer, as someone who's also uh, whose family migrated from Haiti to Canada, I can say that a lot of this question for me is approached through first accepting that we cannot recuperate everything. And that even when we, there's this idea that we have everything. So for example, with Mary and Shai Carey, there is a lot of, there are a lot of records that have been preserved. I mean, the fact that her passport has been preserved is really amazing. Like her family did great work in preserving all of that. But for a lot of women, for a lot of people, for a lot of, you know, general histories, that information isn't there. And so as Charles mentioned, it's piecing together what, what, is there. So um, just as a quick example, a friend of mine who's of Congolese descent is working on her own history. And so she uses photography to try to reimagine um, ancestry, to try to reimagine um, uh, Baluba cosmology, which is a uh, African Congolese cosmology. And so what she did is that with me, because she knows there's a connection between Haiti and Congo, because we know that the rhythms some of the rhythms in Congo, some of the rhythms in Haiti are actually literally the same. That's how we know there's a connection between Congo and Trinidad, Congo and Haiti, Congo and Cuba, because the rhythms stayed the same. And so we actually explored with, you know, what happens when she gives me pieces of what she knows about her research and what happens in my body, how do I move? And some amazing things have happened and um, we can't make, very rigid statements about what that means, but we can still explore it. Like I, I think a lot of the research, when a lot has been lost, it's about exploring and about being open to reconnect to different things, to new things. Um, and to, yeah, and, and I'd say like Charles, to understand that um, we can make connections and, and interpret how something might have happened. Or even again, asking your question of why are you looking at this specifically? And that will probably shift the way you now approach or, or what type of answer you're looking to get out of it. I don't know if that was clear. Um, I, you know, sometimes it's difficult to, to speak without very tangible examples. But if you'd like to talk about it more, I'm, I'm open. That was wonderful, Emily. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists um, for this really um, engaging and stimulating um, q and I'm going to turn it back over to Lynette Overby um, so she can talk a little bit about um, Shad's Daughters and some of the upcoming events. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you, thank you to the panelists as well. It was, you know, we as artists, we sometimes don't talk to other people besides ourselves. And, and so it's, it's very uh, uh, enriching to hear from our, our audience as well as the other artists. So we wanted to take our production another step. Um, and that was to focus on who we call Shad's Daughters. So these are women living today, ranging in age from their 30s to 102, living in rural, urban environments, who we could see through their stories are living or have lived aspects of Marianne Shad Carey's legacy. So we interviewed uh, 10 women from Canada and US and so far we've uh, transcribed and we've coded and we've selected passages that we're gonna share on December 10th. The researchers were A.T. Moffat, Rosalind uh, Green, Deanna Roberto, and um, today, one or a couple of those daughters are going to share a little bit with us. So first, we're going to hear from Ray Jones Avery, who's the president of 100 Black Women. She is a cultural and creative icon, I say, from Delaware. Um, she was a longtime uh, executive director of the Christina Cultural Arts Center, 
currently recently retire and exploring, as she says, spirit led creative ventures in music and writing. Ray. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm proud to be one of Mary Ann Shad Carey's daughters, uh, and I am a practicing artivist, uh, uh, which means that I'm a pr I, I, I practice more activism than I do my art form. Uh, but my desire is to, is to bring the the two together. Uh, kudos to everyone that has lifted this great woman out of obscurity. Um, your, this work is really tremendous. Uh, so I was asked to ponder the question of why it is important to honor the legacy of Mary Ann Shad Carey. And um, in, thinking of, and in thinking about that, it seems kind of obvious, uh, giving, given her tremendous contributions um, to, to the world. Uh, but in thinking about that, the spirit said to me that she is, is, is both prologue and now. Uh, right now, the 21st century Black woman remains the most unprotected segment of society. And while we don't uh, always refer to ourselves in modern day language as suffragists, um, we are compelled to raise our voices boldly and actively to advocate for the, for the rights of women, um, to be seen, um, pick a subject. We, we, we have to speak out loudly to just to be seen as, as human beings and not, uh, and not objects. Um, so Marianne Shad Carey's courage uh, strikes me the most. Uh, activism uh, places uh, activists very often in uncomfortable situations and, un and, and uncomfortable places uh, spiritually. Um, uh, and so not only is she inspirational, but she's catalytic um, because we're still breaking new grounds as first. Uh, our sister B.B. Ross Coker that you'll hear from later was the first and only woman in Delaware to premiere an off-Broadway theater work. Uh, our sister Lisa Blunt Rochester is the first African-American and the only woman to represent Delaware in the, in the Congress of the United States. So we're still breaking grounds um, as, as black women first. And so you all know of uh, sister Kamala Harris, um, is the first African-American woman to be on the Democratic ticket. And so we're still fighting voter suppression. Uh, how can we not be compelled to keep her, her legacy alive in, in contemporary and in relevant ways? So as an artist, again, my contributions um, as a Shad daughter have, uh, have been more on the volunteerism side. I'm still waiting for Ralph Russell to write, uh, to compose some music for me. <laughs> uh, the, I'm the president of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. And uh, several years ago, we launched the Mary Ann Shaq Carey, Margaret Rose Henry Civic Engagement Institute. It's founded by our immediate past president, Melanie Daniels, former mayor of the city of Wilmington, James Baker, and Mary Ann Miller, who thought, and, and they were just driven that we must not only uh, make people aware uh, of the contributions of Mary Ed Shea Carey, but to keep her alive by training and leadership and, uh, uh, and creating leadership development um, opportunities um, in modern day black women. And so this civic engagement um, uh, leadership program is a partnership with Delaware State University. And over the last three years, more than 70 women have graduated. Um, so it's, it's indeed an honor and a, and a privilege um, to carry forward the legacy of our uh, of our remarkable sister. So um, thank you for um, the inclusion um, of me today, and um, I'm, I'm I'm really um, thinking about a lot of things, but I'm mostly thinking about Emily. Uh, uh, some of her some of the remarks that she's made that when we lift up uh, people like Mary Ann Chad Carey, uh, we we talk about contributions and, and history making, and that's absolutely what we should be doing. But we don't we don't think of, of us as women and, and, and who, what our lives are like in our private moments that are not in the that are not public facing. And so thank you for 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 raising that in the conversation. Thank, thank you, you so much, Ray. <laughs> thank you, Emily. <laughs> yeah, so um, next, we're going to hear from B.B. Coker, 
and Ralph Russell. Um, so BB was recently named one of the 100 most influential women in Delaware. Every state had uh, a number. Um, and she has been, um, she's done life, lifelong service work in the arts and education, the church, community, and history uh, organizations. So this uh, duet, she was one of, you know, that first group I talked about that came together, learned about the history, and she went off and created a poem. And she's going to share that um, while Ralph uh, sings. We hope this is going to work in Zoom. Um, so, you know, let's keep our fingers crossed. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ralph and Bibi. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Bibi does not seem to be coming through to most of us, even though she is singing, and we assume singing beautifully. Bibi, we Bibi, cannot if, hear you. Bibi, if there's a mic, maybe you can unplug the mic and go direct into the computer. We can't hear you. Not a word, we're so sorry. <laughs> well, okay, well, we will just move on. Um, we have another uh, performance and it's to a poem by uh, one of my good friends, uh, Glennis Redman, and it's called Torchbear. So Emily and I had an opportunity through Zoom to begin working on some choreography um, that um, incorporated Ralph's music as well as Glennis's uh, poetry. Um, and Glennis, has, we've collaborated on several projects. This is the most recent. So we'll, we're gonna try again on Zoom. Let's see how this works mm -hmm. with Emily and Torchbear. <laughs> Okay, perfect. I'm about to screen share. Torch Bear for Marianne Shad Carey by Glennis Redman. Because A.D. and Harriet believe that I could do anything. And being their eldest child, I believe them. <laughs> they passed the torch of abolition to me. I took it without hesitation or fear because fear is an emotion not worthy of feeling or following. So I followed in the footsteps of my father. He wrote for the liberator and later I published the provincial freeman. I broke the editorial ice went where no woman had gone before. Yes, it was cold and lonely, but I felt compelled as a story gatherer. What better way to inspire our people than with their own hardships, struggles, and triumphs? I pointed many people north to Canada as I could, even in this, its frigid temperature, it's warmer anywhere where black people can be free. 
Better a few shivers than your life. This is the fire I keep alive. Pass from my family, I pass the torch and let it spread, let it leap to the masses because education, reading and staying informed is walking toward freedom. See the light. Once you are warmed by it, you will never go cold again. You will know your worth. Keep stepping and heading in that direction. I work tirelessly because racial uplift is noble but heavy work. And I wore as many hats as I could while doing the lifting, teacher, lawyer, publisher, abolitionist. Because Quaker beliefs were embedded in my soul. I did not act alone. It was not a solo effort, but I never tired of loving my people. I gave my mission my whole heart and mind because self-reliance is the fine road to independence. I believe it is better to wear out than to rust out. On June 5th, 1893, I lay my head down for the last time, but torch bearers are always, always make sure the fire and the path are lit. I left a clear path so my people can see the way to get from here to there. So um, <laughs> Dr. Lynette Overby and myself um, choreographed this piece. It was primarily um, Lynette who, who really coached me through some of the movements she wanted to see, some of the expression, and, and we tried it. And we spent a couple weeks working on this. And this is the first product, I would say, of um, potentially a, a much richer piece. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily, for going with, with me in this Zoom world. Uh, and, and it was very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, I think that we might be trying to get um, Bibi Coker on the line once again. Um, so just give us a second. We'll see if um, we can get her connected to audio. And I am um, unfortunately not hearing anything. Oh. Uh, Chris, can you hear me now? Yes, this is wonderful. <laughs> okay, you can hear me. Yes. Okay, right? Shall I start reading it? Please do, yes. Okay. I am the daughter the sister, the wife, the teacher, the protector and friend who stands your guard. For no one can stand in these so-called halls of freedom lest they be free. Free in mind and heart and soul, lest they be unchained, unenslaved, not of human bondage. Who can stand? Who can stand when reduced to things, reduced to invisibility? reduced to own the buy. Who can stand? I am your past, your present, your future, the length and breadth of your humanity. I am nationhood in shades of bronze and blacks and tans and browns. I live in recognition of the finite, capable of being bound, incapable of allowing bondage to consume me. In the beginning I was, I am now, and who better than a black woman can define a nation? Women who walked. Don't need the road we trod, bitter the chastity rod, felt when the days when hope unborn had died yet with a steady beat 
have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. Women who walked this nation's path to freedom on roads filled with hatred and bigotry and racism. Women like Mary Shad Carey, born free yet bound to the belief that all men have the right to freedom. All men are born free. She gave her voice to the voiceless, her words to the illiterate, her heart to the enslaved, and her soul to her savior. Mary Shad Carey. And women like her, Pauline Young, Alice Dunbar Nelson, Atlanta Brown, Dr. Hilda Davis, pioneer professor, University of Delaware, Pauline Dyson, pioneer elementary teacher for Claymont Steelworks, Dr. Ruth Laws, Dr. Wilma Mishu, Dr. Reba Hollingsworth, public servants like Hattie Phelan, Emily Morris, Grace Batten, Henrietta Johnson, Delaware women, Stephanie Bolden, Margaret Rose Henry, and first among pastoral servanthood, Bishop Aretha Morton, and a first in the halls of Congress, Lisa Blunt Rochester. We are all because of Mary Shad Curry. We are because Mary Shad Curry imposed bondage on her freedom to set. Her sisters, God with us in silent tears, set our feet on the path to freedom, to nationhood. And I feel just like a nation is rising up inside of me. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the presence has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. That was so beautiful. What a wonderful way to sort of close out this session. Um, and so um, now I'm going to actually um, throw it back to Gabrielle and she can help us um, get you guys engaged and excited about our upcoming events. So on December 10th, um, we'll be learning even more about Shad's daughters. Um, I'm just so delighted. And Lynette, actually, I might ask you to say a little bit about Shad's daughters and the oral histories that the team conducted with people in Canada and in Delaware um, and in DC, some of whom are descendants um, and how you're gonna share that, um, including um, Ray and Phoebe um, who are here today. Yes, we're, we're so, we've been so inspired just by learning these stories of these women. And, uh, you know, we say we all have stories to tell and they, those stories are, are very impactful. What we're hoping to do, our plan, is to take quotes from each of the women and have their quote and have a dancer interpreting the quote and piece that all together into um, a sharing that will take place. Um, we'll, we'll videotape it and have it ready to present on December 10th. So that, that's our plan, but we have just had a, a great, um, it's just been a great opportunity to learn these women's stories and connect them to Mary Ann Shad Carey's legacy. Thanks. As Ray Jones Avery said, uh, Mary Ann Shad Carey is both prologue and present, a catalytic force that allows so many of us to be here to, just, to, to think about, I think what Dr. Overby said, 
to put us uh, ourselves in the place of someone who had to fight so hard to create educational opportunities for black women and girls um, who uh, to, do, to, to express her own voice um, as an editor, um, a pioneer in law as the first black woman in the United States to enroll in law school. What does it mean to be this kind of pioneer? And how has it inspired and provided a catalytic force to those in journalism, in law, in education today? How are we Shad's daughters? And then in the events that follow in 2021, and we'll be talking with archivists from various locales who have some of the papers that Emily talked about requesting to be digitized. Uh, Moreland Spingarn um, has um, uh, already digitized their papers, and we'd like to thank them publicly uh, today for that work. And we'll be working over the next several years to digitize those papers. Um, Nika Denny, who I believe is here today, is involved in an exciting project um, around some work um, of producing um, all of her writings in another form. And in, in, in addition to that, we want to talk um, with scholars. There's no edited collection um, uh, on, on Marianne Shad Carey that takes up her work as a thinker, as an intellectual, um, as a catalyst, right? Um, and uh, we're thinking through how we can come together as a scholarly community with artists who are uh, reciprocally engaged in resuscitating this history and have always, as Black communities, always have been involved in keeping the legacy of our ancestors alive. And we want to do this collectively um, with you here um, in various spaces. And then by 2023, um, transcribing her records together um, for Douglas Day. And uh, we really want to think through, too, and ask you to think, how do you want to uh, celebrate Marianne Shag Carey's legacy in 2023? What planning can be done now to think through um, the poetry that can be created, the dance that can be done, the papers that can be written, the transcription that can happen, the digitization that we can do collectively to resurrect um, her work, her words, um, her spirit, and to embody those today. Um, so um, with that, um, we would like to just turn this over uh, to Kristen Mariah with our thanks to, uh, to, to say goodbye um, and to thank her for all of the amazing scholarship that she is doing um, as a, a scholar at Queens um, in Canada. Um, and as an organizer and as an artivist or a scholarist um, uh, as well. So Kristen, I hope that you will uh, be able to, to close us off for today. Thank you. And thank you so much for that handover, Gabrielle. Um, I, I love the term scholarist. I think I'm gonna adopt that in my just general practice. <laughs> Um, so it's it's my it has been my great pleasure actually to um, to be a part of this event um, and to welcome everybody here. I'm so honored that we were able to hear from Emily, Lynette, Ralph, Charles, and April. And um, I hope that um, they will be able to join us at our next event on December 10th, and that you'll be able to join us as well. Um, thank you so much for all of your energy and the excitement that you brought um, in the chat and your presence here today. And we really appreciate it. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you on December 10th. Um, so please um, stay tuned to our, um, our social media um, to learn more about how you can sort of pick up a recording of this um, event and also to keep in touch um, and to keep up to date um, about our upcoming events. We'd also just want to say thank you to the IT team oh that made God. this possible and to name them Kevin Winstead, Denise Berger, Jennifer Isay. If you'll unmute yourself and and uh, and and uh, wave at folks, Lauren Cooper. Um, we just want to say thank you to all of the people who uh, struggle to make this kind of work happen in the background. They have been patient and wonderful with us. And as we're all on Zoom, we want to acknowledge the labor, time, patience, brilliance, and organizational energy that also has everything to do with the legacy Marianne Shag Carey has embodied and modeled for us. So thank you to you guys as well. Um, we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
good working with you all. Hey everybody, across the world today, something is moving. Please don't get in the way, it's lifting spirits, the poor can feel its power, it's getting closer, this is no time to cow, everybody, another world is possible. 